Here we go. So for problem number 1A, thank you. For problem number 1A, what is it asking you to find? A probability. Whenever we find probability, what do you have to start with? Z-score. And even before you do a Z-score, what do you have to do? Define your variables. In order to do a Z-score, you have to talk about your distribution. Let me do it this way. So, this is what I'm looking at. You have to first start by talking about what your distribution is. Shape, center, spread. If you wanted to write out that it follows a normal distribution and then just use this, that's fine. But you have to talk about shape, center, spread. You have to show Z-score. In order to show any probability, you have to show the corresponding test statistic. And right now, our only test, is <laughs> test statistic is a z-score. You also need to be able to show an idea of what is it that you're looking at for probability. So either a probability statement or a normal curve drawn with it shaded in. And I'm just writing this here in blue. It's a different color, so you knew that's not exactly part of my work, but that's how I got this answer. Raise your hand if you got the answer. Okay. Raise your hand if you did a z-score. Mm, raise your hand if you did this, if you wrote down your distribution. Are we seeing our issues here? Cameron. That's, they'll accept it actually either way. They accept both of those as being correct calculations. So don't worry about that. What we do is the idea that the area under a single point, there is no area under a single point. Uh, it's an idea from calculus. You have to look at a whole range. So it's not going to affect you if you do 140. Because it's like there's nothing under just 140. So if you actually look, I don't, I don't know, let me see if I have this in the grading rubric. So if you look here, it says uses the correct boundary, boundary value, 140, 140.5, and 141. All of those are acceptable. Okay? Take a little bit of stress off of that. All right? Now I want you to look at this. It says indicate use of a normal distribution and clearly identifies the correct parameter values showing the components of a z-score calculation is sufficient. Components of a z-score calculation, that means mean, standard deviation, and talking about the fact that it is in fact normal. That's one piece. Then uses the correct boundary value. That's what I was doing when we're talking about this statement here. I'm looking at where x is bigger, so that boundary value is 140, but I'm looking at the larger values. And then reports the correct normal probability with, uh, consistent with whatever your components were. What's nice about this is if you look, it says partially correct if only two of the three components were listed. If, for example, you had the wrong standard deviation, but you finished off the problem correctly, you could still get a P on that. And they do go back and they check that. And that was kind of a saving grace for some folks on some of the um, test questions. So even if you calculate A wrong, but you do B off of A correctly, you'll get credit for B. Okay. One of the things that we're going to work on now that we've kind of hit this stage is how to maximize your score. Because we're going to get to, to some things where you're, you know that every time you see this question, you have to put this down. Hey, put that down, boom, you got a point. Even if you have no clue what you're doing for the rest of it. Okay, and then we look, yes, I've got them graded. I need to look to see when you're next, um, I think we have flex tomorrow. No? Friday. Um, if you want to see it before then, come on in. You're more than welcome to. They're all graded, uh, but we will sit down and do them on Friday. That's all I've got planned for, for flex. Okay, just for some reason thought that was tomorrow. Yay, brain. Okay, so uh, for part C, see it was kind of 
uh, nice what they ask you to show here. This is what my work ended up being for C. You didn't need to talk about this here. The fact that what I'm looking for, the probability I'm using is that the fact that the day is not Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Hey, guess what? That leaves Monday or Friday. So that's two of the five days. What you need to see here, go with these green dots. You need to see the fact that no days are Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. So that means two-fifths to the third or 0.4 to the third. Then the corresponding answer. These two things are really all that's required for that problem. When we do probability, you get to show the work and the answer. Just the answer is an E. Work plus answer is a, I'm sorry, just an answer is a P. Work plus answer is an E. Okay? How do we do on that one? All right. So you're going to start seeing that a lot of this stuff kind of, um, it all goes together. It all overlaps. It all kind of lends itself to each other. And it's kind of nice the way that does it. But you can see here that this is the uh, grading rubric that they give us uh, for this question. Essentially correct if you calculate the probability and show sufficient work. Okay? All right. So for this unit, what we've been doing so far has been focusing on sampling distribution models. And we've talked a lot about the fact that no matter what the population distribution is, whether it's normal, unimodal and symmetric, and you have that 68, 95, 99.7 rule, or it's something really, really funky and crazy, when we start looking at all possible samples from that population, things start to look more and more normal. And any time I say the word normal in this class, that means centered at the average, standard deviation, and your 68, 95, 99.7 rule applies. So don't just think I'm like, normal, you're average, yay. Normal is a distribution, not a state of being. I don't have to be normal. It's all good. All right. We've also said that as your sample size increases, the central limit theorem says that whatever your sampling distribution starts off at starts to look more and more normal. So here we go. The central limit theorem does not change ever. The central limit theorem says, and you've already got this written down, so you shouldn't have to write it down again. For a sample size sufficiently large, the distribution of the sampling statistic, whether that's the proportion, the mean, the minimums, the maximums, whatever statistic you're looking at, all possible samples and their, average, their measurements for that start to look more and more normal which means we start to follow this. That's what normal means. And whatever you want your value to be that you're calculating goes in the middle, and you calculate your standard deviations for that value going out, and we get to do that lovely 68, 95, 99.7 rule. So that's still the same. That's nice. And what we talked about um, also last class are the things that you need to show for this. We're going to be slowly adding to this list just a little bit. This is really the key chunk to it. And that is that you want to always start by talking about identifying what your context is. Am I talking about population? Am I talking about a sample? Uh, what do I think this is going to be? What are my context pieces? If they give you mean, standard deviation, proportion, sample size, you list all of those out to kind of figure out what assumptions and conditions you're going to need to check. And if you pass your assumptions and conditions, you're going to describe the model. That little word describe is going to change as we go through because it might also include names. We have names for different models. Find the z-score always and probability if you want and then always answer in full context. So that's all the same. Oh. So the assumptions and conditions that we've had, again, this is all the same. I'm not changing anything here. I'm just trying to bring it back to the forefront. Central limit theorem, the first assumption was well, independence, that idea of random fell under here. But the first thing that we needed and that we're going to always need to apply the central limit theorem is the independence assumption. Because if you've got things that are affecting each other, your whole kind of story starts to change as you go through it. What was the other one? Sample size. 
because if we're using the central limit theorem, it says as my sample gets bigger, I get more and more normal. Well, where is that cutoff? Where is that point I have to be at to start saying, okay, we're going to look kind of normal now. And then when we were talking about proportions, we met those assumptions and conditions. Independence was met by randomization. And what else? 10%. But if you knew that your sample was independent, like coin flips should be independent, rolling a dice should be independent, spinning a wheel should be independent as long as nobody's got it rigged up, which does happen. Just warning you. All those carnival games rigged up. But those meet my independence assumptions. So if you can't state independence, you check these two. And what did I have for sample size for proportions? Success, failure, which said what? NP and NQ, at least 10 greater than or equal to 10. Okay, 10 is actually okay. You're kind of making me go a little if you hit 10. But that's good. So this is what we're talking about with proportions. What happens if I change that to means? Didn't you like that? I was so excited to do that. Like if I change that to means, can I still talk about randomization? Do we have randomizations when I'm taking average height? Yeah, that's, I mean, just like anything else. Same thing with 10%. You still don't want your sample to be too big. Do I have success failure when I'm dealing with means? If I'm trying to take the average height, am I going to have a success for an average height? Ow. He's out. Can't do that one. See, I, I try. A little bit interesting. Eh, not so much. You're not going to have the success failure. You are still going to have your independence but our sample size is no longer going to be met by success failure. That only works with proportions. So what we're going to do is have to kind of tweak this a little bit. You're, and we meet this by, we now start calling it a nearly normal condition. So proportions, we have success failures, at least 10 of each. For means, we have this nearly normal condition that we need to meet instead. Okay. Ready to see what the nearly normal condition says? Survey says, I want to go home. We were talking before, remember seeing a picture kind of like this when we were doing little bloop, 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 drop down boxes, things, and we said, hey, what happens when I go through all of this? Well, we said if we've got this, this is uh, just that, that app, here's a really strange situation. As n increased, what happens to the sample size? Uh, as n increased, what happened to the sample size? It did increase, because I just said as n increases. And n, yeah, that was weird. Here is sample of size 2. It, it, I mean, I can kind of see the original guy in there. Do you see him? I got a little bit of, I uh, got some random peaks here. But it's now kind of, it's kind of coming in. But would you call that normal? Probably not. I mean, you might have a very de strange definition of normal, and it's not the statistics one. Okay, this is n equals 5. Um, what do you think? It's, it's more normal, but I'm seeing what looks like a little bit of a skew. I'm seeing it's, it's just, it kind of still looks a little bit wonky. I'm not sure if that whole 68, 95, 99.7 rule is going to hold. If I go up to 10, um, that's getting a little bit better. I mean, it still seems to be a little bit skewed-ish a little bit. Do you see that? It's, I mean, it's definitely getting better. And then here's 25. That's, that's starting to look pretty good. So as we go for a larger sample size, look at what's happening to the variability. The variability is going from a clear spread from basically 0 to 32 to now a majority of your data is starting to come and cluster more tightly towards the center. When we're at 25, it's looking pretty good. We're actually looking really symmetric at this point in time. So things are looking nice. Now, what happens with this nearly normal condition is the answer is it depends. Okay? 
there's not like a nice cutoff like we have with proportions where we said NP and NQ have to be bigger than 10. We're, we're good here, but we're not quite that good. So sometimes we consider it the nearly normal or the large enough condition. Still kind of that idea of large enough. If the population distribution starts off as normal. So like if I'm talking about height, height is a very normally distributed value. IQ, very normally distributed. It's kind of why they did it the way they did it. Birth weights, very normally distributed. If I start off with something that's normally distributed, then you don't really have to worry too much about the sample size. If you start with a normally distributed population, it doesn't really matter what your sample size is. But there's very few cases where we can say without a doubt, hey, these guys are normal. So what does that mean? If your population distribution is not normal, anything, like that wonky picture that we had up here that we started off with, that was not normal. Then we kind of set this arbitrary value at 30. And some textbooks take different approaches. Our textbook actually says, okay, if it's got some normality to it, 15 is okay. If it's got unimodal but not quite symmetric, 20 is okay. Everybody wants a nice clear-cut definition. Let's go with 30, okay? If your sample size is, is 30 or above, we don't even really have to care about what your initial population distribution looks like. Because we saw in that last graph that, yeah, two looked weird, five looked better, but I'm not sure about my specific distributions. 10 was pretty good, 15, was looking, I'm sorry, 25 was looking really good. So we're just going to say, hey, if we have 30 in a sample, we'll kind of take that as, a, we'll accept it and move on with it. But if, you need to understand, if the population distribution, if what we start with is normal, it doesn't really matter. Okay? Okay. And you don't need to, guys, I, I hope you understand when you're taking notes, it's a big thing for when you get to college. Don't write down every single word that's up there. I would write down population normal, sample size doesn't matter. Population not normal, need at least 30. That's what I would have written down from that slide. Okay? All right. Whoop! Central limit theorem and means. What does it mean? What does it mean? Hey, wait a minute. I've seen this statement before. Today already even. Sample size increases. Sampling distribution looks more and more normal. I feel like a parrot. It's a long statement for a parrot. Here, more words saying the same thing. Big enough sample. Distribution looks close to normal. Are you surprised yet? This is what it does for means. Whoa, 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 exactly. For proportions, we said it was normal, centered at, for proportions, what did we have here? P, what did we have for this? root PQ over N. For means, we centered at whatever we think the population mean is. And for the sample, whoa, back up, the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. That's the way it's going to work. So some of you guys have already started looking at your Chapter 17 questions, which are beautiful. Okay. If you were looking at some of the mean problems, this is now, and I don't mean, I, I love saying the mean problems. They're still mean. Dad joke, stats joke, same thing. Okay. You can see what our distribution here is going to be. And once we are able to satisfy our assumptions and conditions, so our assumptions and conditions here now, we have either independence, 
which is really hard to do when we're talking about um, means. It's easy with proportions because you have a lot of things where the proportion never changes. But So we go to the independence and we meet it with randomization. Either randomization or representative. Samples need to be representative. We hope randomization gets representative. Okay. No more than 10% of your sample size, but you want a sample, hopefully, of 30 or more. So if I need a sample of at least 30, what does my population kind of should be? At least. Sample has to be at uh, least 30. The population has to be at least 300. Okay? All right. So with what I just said, whoop, 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 focusing in yellow print, go back to your warm-up to the frappy and answer part B. A said probability, where we're talking about everybody. It wasn't a sample, it was everybody. B, now we're doing a sample of three randomly chosen days. And we want to find the probability with that. What changes from the population distribution to the sample distribution? Anybody know what changes? What changes? Standard deviation changes. Otherwise, you work it through the same. So what we need to understand here, the big difference, part A was talking about a population distribution. X followed the normal model, entered at what was the mean, 120, what was the deviation? This is no longer talking about the population. It's talking about a sample. A sample of how many days? Three days. So now, rather than dealing with a population distribution, what we have is a sample of three. So instead of x, I have x bar. What does x bar represent? What does that notation mean? Mean means the sample mean. So the sample mean will follow a normal distribution, still centered at that same place, 120. But now the standard deviation is going to be 10.5 divided by the square root of 3, my sample size. Okay? So what they're looking for in this problem, there were actually several different ways that you could answer it. They needed you to make sure that you were talking about, first and foremost, a sampling distribution, not the population. A was population, so it was just X. Now this is a sample. This is X bar. The sampling distribution, you should say, is going to have less variability. You could have either used those words or... You could have actually calculated it. But to talk about less variability, you don't just say 6.062 is less variability. You say 6.062 is less than 10.5. It's not less than unless you compare it to something. And I have to know what you're comparing it to. So you can either say it's going to be less likely because there is less variability. The standard deviation is smaller and actually show it. Or... You can go through the steps and calculate the probability, just like we did in A. And the probability for this guy, it's not zero. It's pretty small, but it's not zero. It's 0 0.0005. And that, compared to the original, is less likely. I'm going to... didn't know if it was just a... It's like one of those... Okay few key points here, and this is, it's not about just saying, hey, look, I've calculated the new percentage, I'm right. The key points is you need to make sure that you identify that this is a sampling distribution, 
You can either do that by talking about a sample of three or x bar rather than x. And then if they're asking you what's changing, you have to actually compare things. Either comparing the standard deviation or comparing the final probabilities. Yes, sir. Yes, exactly. When you're talking about proportions, you said populations. When you're talking about proportions, this piece here, that sigma, is root PQ over N. When you're talking about samples, it's uh, for a mean, it's sigma over root N. So you have a square root and you have an N in the denominator for both. Okay? So just so that you can see what the rubric here would be looking for, this is one of their example answers. That's redonkulous. If you wrote that much, I thought you'd be crazy. But they're explaining the fact that it would be less likely. It says less variability, which would be more narrow, smaller probability of exceeding 140. So what they've done here is they've explained it using words. What they've done here is they've explained it using numbers, specifically talking about the standard deviation. So comparing the standard deviations, you can see that your z-scores and your resulting probabilities are also going to be less likely. Okay? And then this is all the craziness that they look at for the grading. They say, you can do this, or this, or this. So you can either talk specifically in words about sampling distributions going to be smaller but centered at the same spot, you can talk about the probabilities. I was really surprised on this one that you couldn't just talk about z-scores. I might have actually said z-scores. They probably would have taken that. But I don't want to speak for them. And then this is just saying partially correct if you say less likely and then you have two of the choices. All right. So here's another practice problem. This one is from the text, so it's not in your notes. Okay. This is not a math number problem. This is a math thinking problem. Read through it. Try to figure out what it's trying to say here. Now, technically speaking, when I do problems that come straight from the textbook, these should match very closely with what you see on my math lab. Why is that considered skewed left? The tail is towards the left or to the lower values. You just kind of want to keep on top of those. Whoops. For A, what do you think? Would the normal model be useful? for this sampling distribution. Why or why not? Everybody's so hesitant to say anything. It's okay if you're wrong. It means we just talk through it. What do you think? Yes or no? Yes, raise your hand. No, raise your hand. People who waited for everybody else to raise your hand, raise your hand. Oh, that's not that bad. The answer here is no. The normal model would not be appropriate. But why? Because of the sample size. It actually doesn't have anything to do with the fact that it's skewed, very heavily so. What is my sample size for this? One more time. Five. So if the sample size is five and the data starts off as really, really skewed, no bueno. Um, what sample size would I have needed to be able to use the normal model? 30. If I kept my sample size at 5, what would have made it possible for me to use the normal model? 
if it started off as normally distributed. Okay, think about what we just said. B, could I use the 95% thing to talk about between 7 and 46.3? Here's a hint. What was the answer to A? No, if I can't use the normal model, can I use my standard deviation and empirical rule? No. Do you understand what's going at here? Oftentimes, one of your guys' biggest mistakes is you're not thinking in context. You're saying, oh, okay, so this is the standard deviation. This is what I'm looking for. I'm going to go ahead and calculate. Yes, that, that's the one standard deviation, two standard deviations out. That's not what it's asking you here. If you can't use the normal model, you can't use the empirical rule. Okay? Boop. Yep, we like doing that sometimes. All right. This one is in your notes. Just wanted to make sure you know I'm not actually giving you popcorn. And there's not really popcorn in the problem. Sitting there and didn't even remember. So, for that last problem, which I forgot to hit record, just being honest, this is what we came up with. We said that my what I'm looking at was the number of movies viewed by high school students. We're looking at the average, so x bar. And the sampling distribution should follow the normal model, at least this is what we're hoping for, centered at 19.3 with this first standard deviation. Standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. And so when we're talking about the mean, the mean of the sample, please notice that we have context here, 19.3 movies, should be centered at the population mean. So that's my explanation, because the sampling distribution should be centered at the population mean. Then we did the standard deviation. Standard deviation, we said, is sigma over root n. So that gave us 1.58 movies, again, in context. And the 10% condition is only met if there are more than 1,000 students total. We didn't really worry too much about the other ones, but you will have to check those. We were told it was random by a simple random sample. And because 100 is greater than or equal to 30, we don't really need to worry about what the initial population distribution was. So now we're working on problem number three. So let's take a look at my answer here. Well, first off, what do you think? Which one is going to be more likely to where a single jar will have less than 16 ounces? Or 10 jars with an average less than 16 ounces? You should have done the probability. Which one worked out, Julia? Which one was... That's okay. The first one, that's okay. I understand. It is actually going to be the first one. And the reason why that is with just one jar. And let's take a look at just the distribution. And actually here. If I were to talk about... No, no, I'll keep that. This is the population standard deviation. This is 16.1. And let's say 16 is right there. And we're looking at the probability of it being less than 16. When I take a larger sample size, what happens? You get less variability, which means this graph is going to squeeze in. So it's going to get taller and more like that. So this would be if n was 10, this is n is 1. Which one is going to have more area to the left of, 60, of 16? The blue or the other color? The blue. Do you understand what I'm talking about? If I'm marking this place, if I'm not changing this, but I'm changing the distribution to have less and less and less variability, 
then I'm going to be pulling it so there's less and less area on that side. Does that make sense? And if that still doesn't make sense, you can do it by calculations. For the one thing, for the whole probability or a sample size of one, normal standard deviation, asking you for a probability, you've got to find a z-score first. This is what I get. But when I start talking about a sample instead of the whole population or a single value out of that population, my standard deviation changes. So the probability for that sample being less than 16 changes also. So this backs up what we said for A. Okay. See some people kind of absorbing. I'm trying to figure out if they're questions. Don't be intimidated to ask questions. If you're asking questions, you're doing somebody else a favor also. Okay. You guys ready to try number four? Number four is going to a full question. Okay, this is a full question. I'm asking you to do a simple, how likely is it? Think back or look in your notes. Make sure you have what needs to be shown. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Okay, so look at your list of what needs to be shown. Uh, you need to focus on what has to actually be shown. Okay, so pay close attention to this. Remember um, when we were at, let me see here, where was it? Here we go. Talk about what you're measuring. Identify all the given pieces, check assumptions and conditions, describe your Nobra model, find your z-score and probability. Okay, this is what we're looking at here. So, here we go. This is what you're looking at. So, we're talking about the number of texts, texts sent where the mean was 45, the standard deviation was 35. So listing my pieces, talking about context. We were told the sample was random. We should be okay if there are more than 500 students. That, that'll satisfy my 10% rule. And 50 is bigger than 30, so we're large enough to continue with a normal model. Are you happy? Are you doing good so far? Looking at the smile on your face going, I don't know how to read that. Is that a sarcastic smile or a good smile? Good smile. Okay. Which means because I have all of this, I can say my X bar, that was supposed to be a straight line, follows the normal model, centered at 45 with a standard deviation of 35 over root 50. And the one thing you needed to catch here, if I had a total, this was talking about average, if I had a total of 50 students and 2,500 texts, the average would be 50 been really weird to have used 2,500 in your calculations here. So my z-score is that 50 observed minus expected over the standard deviation. And the probability that we're greater than or equal to 50 should be about 0.1562. So yes. That's fine. That's fine. That should work too. You just have to be careful because this goes back to my random variables and how my standard deviation and means are affected when I combine various things. Doesn't matter. If you do, you, are you talking about why not less than? No, I'm just talking about why. My sample had that many for the average, and it doesn't really matter if you put greater than or equal to or just greater than. Uh, if you, it's talking about the area under the curve, and at equal to, there's actually nothing there. So it doesn't matter. Okay. So we're not, yeah? Oh, dear Lord, no. No points lost there. I really don't care. Half the times I'll put it there, half the times I won't. Okay. So we're not going to really finish number five today. We'll come back and we will do that next class, which is actually a frappy. 
Um, so again, we'll talk about that next class. Just remember, your homework is the My Math Lab online or the Khan Academy. You really need to be doing the, everybody in here pretty much, we'll I'll talk to you separately, Avni, has the My Math Lab. We're going to be doing the quest over sampling distributions next class. So we'll start next class off with um, the FIPI that we didn't get to today. We'll do a problem from proportions and answer any questions y'all might have. And so if you find that you're having problems on a homework question, just make note of what problem number it is, and I will go back and we can talk about that also.